Welcome to the Millennial Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Clay Fink. And today I have a very exciting guest for you all, Tavi Costa. Tavi, welcome to the show. Hi, Clay. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to have you on the podcast because with the crazy macro environment we find ourselves in, I'm constantly evaluating ways to potentially protect myself from what, from what lies ahead. During today's conversation, we're going to be covering gold, silver, and other ways to hedge against inflation. So let's start with gold. Many of our listeners fall under the Warren Buffett school of thought and will operate under the assumption that a portfolio of high quality businesses will outperform gold over the long run. However, there are periods historically where gold has performed exceptionally well. Why do you believe that now specifically is a good time to own gold? I think there are a lot of reasons why I believe in that. And by the way, I do I do think that Warren Buffett is is correct uh, on on his statements about about gold in general and tangible assets. I think there are times when you want to own tangible assets. Those times they begin with the difficulty of finding uh, yield in general, nominal yield, uh, in alternatives of, of of investments as a whole. And I think we are in one of those times. Uh, we saw that in the 1970s, the 1940s, and the 1910s. All those times were inflationary periods. Um, some of them were more sporadic inflationary times, like the 40s, and some others are more sticky, like the 10s and the 70s. But all the three had one thing in common, which was negative uh, real rates during those times. And the other thing in common was that commodities or tangible assets did better than things like financial assets at those times. And so I think we're entering something similar to that um, in terms of the inflation problem. I think we have the wages and salaries growth. That's number one, uh, which we saw back in the 70s. I think we have the, the supply constraints, this chronic underinvestments in not natural resources that will drive prices higher, continue to drive prices higher, something you cannot fix in the short term. Um, we've got this reckless fiscal spending. Um, now we can get into that, but it's it's certainly something I've been watching very closely and matches with other inflationary times. And the third one is in my view, this end of a globalized world where, uh, where we're seeing geopolitical tensions. And, and that is indeed a very uh, also inflationary pillar uh, to the global economy. So um, I am extremely focused on owning tangible assets today at a time when you have debt, valuation, and inflation playing out in the US, which we haven't seen those three uh, uh, imbalances uh, really unfolding all at once. Uh, we've seen them independently happen throughout history, but not all at once. And so I think this is very unique from a political constraint uh, standpoint, and it, it's the time to be to be allocating capital towards gold and, and other tangible assets too. Hmm. You know, during this inflationary time, we've seen commodities run really hot and gold, you know, has run you know, not as much. Is a bet on gold essentially betting on continued high inflation for the next, you know, five to 10 years? Um, I, you know, I think it's more of an investment on misguided fiscal and monetary policies going forward than inflation itself. Inflation is one of the consequences of that. And so we, we begin to, uh, uh, to mix uh, things. But, but I also think that gold will play a major role when it comes to what's happening with the treasury market. I think um, today's portfolios mostly look like long technology companies and long uh, treasuries and long fixed income as a way of hedging that position. The risk parity uh, popularity has been uh, at, its, at its highs right now. And so I am not sure we're gonna see that going forward or meaning uh, the, the, the outperformance of strategies uh, as such uh, in, in the next 10 years. And so the, the change in capital allocation uh, that will come, in my view, of that, meaning coming out of treasuries and into gold uh, and gold playing into more of that uh, uh, part of the risk parity thesis. But now, instead of owning treasuries, owning gold, I think will be uh, an important part. So large capital allocators um, are not putting enough capital into gold. And, and 1970s was a great example of, of how nominal rates were rising and gold was following the same pattern. It was extremely positive correlated to uh, to nominal rates. Now, how, how incredible is that? I mean, nobody talks about this. Nominal rates in the 70s 
was basically one of the most predictive uh, forms of, of looking at gold prices. They both went up at the same time um, and, and almost the same chart. And so um, I think that that's, that's a bigger case for, for precious metals in general. And for folks that say that gold does not perform very well, gold is what, six percentage points, five percentage points from all time highs. It's really it hasn't been that bad uh, for gold investors. It has been bad compared to other assets in the last 10 years. But is that the right way to be looking at? Should we be looking at the last 10 years and saying, well, that's going to play out, play out in the following 10 years? I don't think so. I think that's a, even adds to the thesis of, of owning precious metals here is the fact that it hasn't worked in the last 10, 20 years or so uh, relative to other things. Um, and so I think we're entering a, a, a very important uh, regime here for, for gold. And, and I think it will outperform a lot of other assets in the next 10 years. So you have to think about well, how do I get, you know, you're not going to get rich buying gold. So how do I, how do I get the, the leverage on that? Um, you know, that, that's why I like silver. That's why I like the miners. And, and, and you can get into uh, those businesses that, that should perform even better than, you know, a 10, 20, 15% uh, increase in gold prices. Hmm. Do you think that what is happening internationally you know, with the Russia Ukraine situation could be a catalyst for gold making a move to the upside. Say, if Russia were to start requiring payments for certain types of commodities in gold or, you know, potentially backing their currency with gold, I've seen talks of that as well. I think absolutely. I think we're seeing the gene is out of the bottle when it comes to protectionist policies and the geopolitical tensions. And I think in my view, that started to turn with Trump in 2016, even a little bit before that. Some folks may disagree. Some folks think it, it started even earlier than that. Well, just think about how this uh, idea about sanctions and the acceptance by the public on sanctions have changed from Trump's era to now. It's it's insane to me. I mean, that's, that's certainly... I would say a lot more of the, the Democratic Party, for instance, is a lot more open. And not only that, they're imposing that in other economies today. And so the shift on those policies is important. And the way commodities are becoming strategic now, macro assets, is another thing to point out because economies are shutting down or, or showing how uh, the reliance on some commodities like oil, like wheat, um, like um, basically any metal, uh, essentially, is, is is starting to become relevant and when it comes to relationships uh, worldwide. And we need to think about what are the economies in, the, in this global stage that will perform better in, in this environment of commodity prices becoming more relevant. And I think this notion that places like China and India will perform very well is very incorrect. And so in my point, I think I think we're going to see other economies like perhaps Brazil uh, emerging as as a uh, as an economy that may actually really benefit from this. I've, I'm from Brazil and I've never been so bullish on Brazil, um, even though there are uh, possibilities of negative outcomes on political side of of changes in political leadership in in the next twelve months and even less now. And I, I, I still think that the, the setup is, is extremely bullish for those economies that do have enough commodities and are more neutral uh, when it comes to the, the relationships in, in the global stage again. So, um, you know, I'm looking for those economies because I think those are going to do well in the next uh, five to 10 years. And, and I think there are great opportunities in those markets. Yeah, I think we are in somewhat of a unique scenario you know i think back to the great depression time frame where a lot of that credit ended up collapsing down to the money supply of gold whereas today you know currencies aren't backed by gold so you know it's interesting to think about certain countries loading up on gold we've i've heard about russia you know buying more gold you know transitioning to you know how investors can hedge themselves against inflation i think many people struggle with the idea of gold because you can't value it because there's there are no cash flows and it doesn't produce anything. So how can investors think about the valuation of gold? Ultimately, I think it's the value of gold is linked to where the monetary base is, money supply is. 
and the the recklessly of of fiscal spending that we see in the economy, the amount of leverage in the system. There are, there are many ways of of looking at those measurements as a way of of figuring out what the gold price should be. The other thing that is important to know is gold tends to struggle when it hits new highs, and which was the case in August of 2020. It was the case in in January or so of, of 2008, and it got caught up in a global financial crisis. Um, in 1978, also did the same. And what is important there is struggles, and then the second lag of that move is the most violent one. I think we're in that one. I think we're entering that regime right now. We saw the kind of the risk off the rally in gold recently because of the war. But it's, it's much more than that. It has nothing to do with the tensions between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, it has to do with the shift from a uh, much more deglobalized world, along with inflationary pillars that are continuing to uh, infiltrate the economy uh, more and more, and the psychological shift of consumers as we see inflation building up. Um, I think you could see a case for gold reaching you know, uh, $3,000 an ounce in the next uh, two to three years. You know, I think it's very plausible. And if you think that way, um, then then you start, you know, now, you know, exp- uh, exploring other other alternatives. You know, what would miners do in that setup, and what would the, the free cash flow of businesses that are in those underlying commodities look like? And it's it's astonishing. I mean, it, it's like those companies are being. Uh, have multiples of businesses that will go out of business in the next uh, three to five years, and I I don't believe in that. I don't I don't think they will go out of business at all. Um, and so, in fact, I think this is one of the best growth and value opportunities we'll see in the next five to ten years. And it will take some time to play out. There's a lot of shifts towards, um, especially the popularity of those assets uh, and the understanding of the opportunity. And I. You know those those trends take take a little long to uh, uh, again to really unfold, and I I think I think we're in the process of that. You look at the miners relative to gold starting to outperform. And it's difficult to make decisions when you're looking at precious metals because they haven't really performed well. But that psychological shift can happen very quickly when you see prices moving higher. Uh, the same happened with commodities three years ago. No one wanted to invest in commodities. We we talked to a lot of investors in that space when it comes to institutional investors trying to invest in funds like ours. And the lack of understanding of this industry is astonishing again. So it's not just a capital trend. It's also the lack of knowledge and labor uh, to really feed uh, this this story going forward. So a lot of imbalances that will create this uh, a very interesting setup for things like gold and silver, but also other commodities. So it's a, it's a very... Uh, very exciting time to be invested in those. You know, since gold has gone through these massive, you know, bull and bear cycles over time, it seems wise to, you know, look to buy and sell at opportune times now being a potentially good time to go long gold. If you could only pick one or two metrics or ratios, you know, to try and judge where we're at in those cycles, what would you suggest? It's certainly CapEx trends. It has to do with the capital spending in the industry. And it's very uh, simplistic to see how the aggregate CapEx of the industry leads to uh, either bull markets or bear markets. It's it's extremely cyclical. And so you see uh, gold prices moving higher, companies become extremely bullish and so they start um, they start losing some of their uh, conservatism. They sp- start spending more money, and so you see capital uh, spending rising to uh, uh, absurd levels relative to uh, other things. And so uh, we are not seeing that yet. M and A cycle M and A cycles tend to also be uh, linked to um, you know the beginning of, of 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 a bull market. Certainly is established by not having too many M and A cycles uh, or M and a uh, uh, activity. And I think this is, is starting to happen now. So uh, we're going to see probably the biggest m and uh, I think we're going to be this, the biggest m and trend uh, in this space that we've seen in, in history. And that is mostly because of the supply cliff 
that most of the miners are facing right now. So they're producing commodities. They're not looking for new exploration assets. And so their budget uh, spent on exploration has shrank uh, significantly now. And in fact, we're not seeing enough new discoveries of not only gold, silver, but also base metals. And so how do we electrify the world and how do we make all this green revolution shifts if we don't have enough metals? And, and those are going to be the ones that drive prices higher. So to your answer to your question, I think um, the capital spending trends are the most important part of it. And we're certainly seeing a major divergence of gold prices where they are relative to this uh, conservatism, which I think is driven by ESG policies and, and the green revolution that is um, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a strange way, also impacting uh, companies to not, uh, not spend enough money. And so uh, it, it, is, it is an interesting time again. And I think, I think we're going to see uh, you know, those, those imbalances in, 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 in the industry itself uh, will we'll probably make one of the biggest bull markets for precious metals and base metals that we've seen in history, particularly to, to the, the companies that are involved with those. I sometimes hear talks of the gold and silver price being manipulated, you know, with things like free hypothecation in the paper markets. I'm curious what your thoughts are on if there's any truth to that idea and why that might even be happening. Look, I'm, I'm open minded to any thesis, right? And I think you should be as an investor. Uh, the issue is for me, I back everything up with, with data and I can't back that up. And so do I think it's just strange that gold is up, you know, uh, on a Sunday afternoon um, when the market opens at 4 p.m. Mountain Time, 6 p.m. Eastern, um, and, then, and then it falls right before the market opens? Um, sure, I think that's strange. And it happens more than once. Um, it happens quite a lot. But I, I just cannot um, really uh, justify what's really happening. And I think... Uh, what we're seeing when it comes to um, when it comes to the thesis behind owning gold is is much larger than any sort of manipulation we're seeing in the markets. I think if you believe in that, you should probably not be invested in gold in the first place. And funny thing is, that most of the people that talk about that are the ones that are investing in gold. So it's it's kind of strange in my view. And and so I think sure that may be happening, but it's also a, a prisoner's dilemma where. I think every central bank in the world also wants to own a lot of gold. So manipulating the price of gold seems kind of uh, um, doesn't doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And when it comes to the long term trends of 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 why you want to own the asset, and you want to own the asset to the point that you made earlier, which is creating an anchor and and improving the credibility of international reserves across the globe in order to also improve the credibility of fiat currencies. Are we able to see, you know, gold purchases by other countries or is it something that, you know, is kind of just flies under the radar? Um, the data when it comes to that is, 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 is just not updated at all. I mean, it's, it's, it's not enough data for us to know exactly what's going on. Political issues in different countries, I would say when Turkey was, and Turkey is always having issues, but uh, more recently we saw Turkey really having issues uh, and being forced to sell some of their gold positions to defend their currency. That's really when you, I think that's linked to the decline in gold prices indeed. Um, and uh, central banks will be the biggest drivers of, of gold prices uh, and, and make those inflection points uh, in this market. Um, but at the same time, so I, I do watch for that very closely. I think we may see a world where um, what's happening right now with, with interest rates uh, in particular, and also uh, with commodities uh, will set off, I think, a, uh, a place where we've, we haven't seen many DPAGs of currencies relative to the dollar. I think we're going to see some of those happen. Uh, and I have my biggest candidates that I think will probably go through that. But um, I think I think those this is all kind of linked to the gold market too, um, and those economies are going to have to be buying gold at some point to uh, or force to buy gold in order to uh, to kind of restore the credibility of their currencies. And so um, it's it's a movement that really you know if, if we think about it, the most credible central banks in the world own U.S. Treasuries, and 
Uh, what are U.S. strategies? That's just debt. Uh, it's insane that we went from owning gold to owning debt from another indebted economy. Yeah, how do you square? Uh, how, how, how do you square that circle when it comes to uh, really uh, 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 justifying the credibility of any central bank that owns debt from another historically indebted economy? It's very difficult, and I think that that's about to change. That's you know that has to change, and you know maybe Bitcoin, maybe other other assets will play into this. This role, but I do think historically, you know, central banks like Russia, China, India, um, you know, Brazil, uh, Canada, Europe, or European economies, um, Japan, all resort back to gold ultimately. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm expecting that the flows are going to be much larger to that asset relative to anything else. For those wanting to get exposure to gold. There are a number of ways to do so. You know, a few include buying the physical gold and storing it somewhere yourself or, you know, with an institutional type custodian, or you could buy a gold ETF, or you could buy even gold miners on just the stock exchange. What are some of the things investors should consider in determining which path might be right for them? I think it all depends on the expected returns. For me, I'm looking for the most asymmetric bet I can find in in this uh, in this industry. And uh, if you if you look across the industry, it, it's basically very simple. I mean, you have exploration assets, you have development assets, you have production assets, and you have the royalty ones. And they are basically ranked by. Uh, levels of risk. And so less risk would be royalties, more risk would be exploration. Uh, when you look across the industry and you do real analysis on what's happening with the industry is certainly what I said before is the supply cliff of the major companies that have consistently generated free cash flow and I'm referring to the producers mostly. And, and so what's been happening is that the producers has been building up a cash balance position uh, that is becoming bigger and bigger. They've been paying down their balance sheets, so meaning they've been paying out their debt to levels we haven't seen in history. They have not been issuing a lot of equity. Um, and so they're cleaning up their balance sheets pretty good in the last uh, in the last, the last three years or so. And with gold prices where they are, yes, can they get some, some um, squeeze from energy prices and, and labor costs? Sure, that, that's, that's another risk. But in my opinion, the best way to make money, empirically speaking, on, on gold cycles is to own gold and silver in the ground. By that, I mean it's finding major discoveries of gold and silver or exploration that will carry the leverage of those minerals, uh, the mineral value um, to a degree that we, uh, you know, that certainly you know, the biggest billionaires or the, the, the billionaires of the industry all made their money, uh, the majority of them made their money in the exploration side of the of, of, of the industry. And so that has been our focus. About 93% of our portfolio is, is in exploration assets because the industry is has not invested enough money there. So there's a lot of inefficiencies. There's a lack of understanding on geology. Uh, it's extremely difficult to navigate the space, not only finding uh, labor to work on those companies, but also uh, uh, finding folks that can actually understand the industry to make investment decisions. And so we can get into some of that process, but uh, of, of how to find those exploration assets too. But it's um, there's a, there are a lot of misunderstandings of, of how to uh, properly invest in space, uh, in my opinion. And, and I think that's setting up an incredible opportunity for a a fund that has this kind of smart capital mentality, long-term mentality that is able to come in and, and take more of an activist role in owning a lot of businesses that are extremely cheap micro cap companies uh, that we think be worth, you know, north of billions of dollars uh, in market cap in the following years. Again, through the value of the mineral relative uh, to the price of, of those of those underlying commodities moving higher because of being in a in a super cycle for those uh, for those assets. Hey guys, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Trade Coffee for supporting the Investors Podcast Network. I've always had trouble finding fresh coffee at the grocery store because a lot of the time it has been sitting on the shelves for weeks and eventually goes stale. Trade Coffee sells the freshest roasted and ethically sourced beans from America's best local roasters. 
They deliver right to your doorstep with free shipping as often as you'd like. I got started with Trade by taking their simple quiz online. It was super easy as they asked me a few questions such as how I make my coffee, whether I'm a coffee expert or beginner, and if I add milk or cream to my coffee. The results matched me with the Nebula Dark Roast. And let me tell you guys, I cannot get enough of it. It was roasted right here in the US in Oakland, California, and it has a comforting and rich taste with added honey to help me satisfy my sweet tooth. Another reason I love Trade is because they support small businesses and ensure they're sourcing their beans from sustainable sources. Trade has delivered over 5 million bags of fresh coffee, and they have more than 750,000 positive reviews. If that isn't enough for you, Trade literally guarantees you'll love your first bag too, or they'll replace it for free. Right now, Trade is offering new subscribers a total of $30 off your first order plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash TIP or click the link in the description below. That's more than 40 cups of coffee for free. Get started by taking their quiz at drinktrade.com slash TIP and let trade find you a coffee you'll love. That's drinktrade.com slash TIP for $30 off your first order. That's very interesting. What types of companies have these you know, minerals in the ground? And is it certain types of commodities that aren't gold and silver? Or could you expand a little bit more on that? Uh, well, there, there, there are a lot of things. Um, you can, you can buy, um, copper, um, exploration assets. You can buy, um, you know, gold, silver, uh, nickel. I mean, there's, there's, there are plenty of different ways you can, you can play that opportunity, I think, but, but it's, um, I think you have to have a view about the metal first and foremost, uh, and, and seeing how economically viable those deposits are. Um, it's, it's certainly extreme. I don't want to sound like there's no risk involved. There's a lot of risk involved, more than almost any investment you will make in your life. <laughs> but I think this is, um, this is the time to be doing that because a lot of those, those companies are not being priced to the risk or the the uh, the probability, the high probability that they have found major discoveries, um, and so that's the interesting part. I mean, some of so basically, a company will issue shares or or look for ways to uh, fund an exploration project. They were going to go poke some holes in in a in in a property and and look for those minerals. Um, if they find, meaning if they have a very high grade intercepts or so forth, or or good geological geological surveys that that present. Uh, that the thesis is is interesting when it comes to an investment standpoint, uh, then you know it should drive the value of that company higher. So uh, the concept of not actually producing for cash flow is interesting because they're just literally deluding themselves to look for uh, for minerals in the ground. What's interesting about this is that the biggest intercepts that we find uh, today are not being rewarded by the market. And if you look back in other times in history where we had gold cycles. Uh, and we had similar intercepts of, of high-grade minerals uh, in the ground. Uh, certainly, we saw appreciation of market caps uh, to uh, levels that we're not seeing today. So the inefficiency in this market is tremendous. Um, and, and so it creates an opportunity. So for a fund like ours to make you know, many bets, you know, 90 companies that we own their portfolio, which maybe one third of them are not going to turn out to be discoveries. Uh, and maybe, you know, uh, 10 or 15 or 20 of those can, you know, if, if we do that, that would be incredibly successful. Some of those portfolios may just be successful with one discovery, uh, where you take a company from five, 10 million market cap all the way up to, you know, four to $5 billion worth. And so that's really what you're looking for here. And 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 there are a lot of retail investors that drive that market. Uh, it's a it's a very illiquid uh, market in general, and and what an opportunity for a fund that has that long term mentality is looking to own you know up to twenty percent stake of those companies and and help them to uh, to succeed in, in searching for uh, geological expertise to uh, uh, to help them to uh, design those drill programs and 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 really find the, the best leadership of those companies in order to succeed um, helping them with the money uh, finance those projects in general look for uh, you know good investors that will uh, support the story as well uh, market those stories too because there, 
there's some marketing involved. Um, and so there's so many angles you can go here. There's really a lot of activism that can be done, uh, but not enough people are doing that. And just one thing I, was, I would mention is uh, the, the common sense of, of investing in exploration assets is, is that you should own, you should try to find large deposits uh, because it's it's more levered to the the uh, the price of those minerals. But the problem is is that usually those large deposits are also involved with very having very low grade um, and and not being as high of a quality of of a um, of a mineral uh, than and other than other uh, opportunities. And so I think that's an issue because you're you're looking for the risk um, and 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 premium. Um, of, uh, uh, I, I think what you're looking for here is, is certainly uh, opportunities that can work in a bull market or bear market. You know, there are many examples. Kirkland Lake was a great example of that, a company that found a, an extension of, of a deposit um, by uh, continuing to explore in an existing producing uh, asset. That's the risk management that I think should be done is, is to look for high quality assets that work in any market, even though... As I said before, I have a very strong view of where we are in this cycle. So, hopefully, I answer some of your questions. But I think, I think that's uh, that's basically the kind of the case for uh, for for this uh, part of the industry. I've considered, you know, buying the physical metal myself, and I noticed that investors are faced with either buying the minted metal or something that is government issued, as well as a number of other options. I'm curious if you have any preference between the two and how investors might want to think about that. So I'm not an expert of the physical market, believe it or not. I think it's the least is asymmetrical way of, of, of betting on this and the cycle. Um, does it mean it's a bad way? No, it doesn't mean that at all. A lot of folks do that and a lot of smart guys do that. I just don't think, um, again, that's the best opportunity uh, relative to how much capital you're deploying and the potential for capital appreciation here. So um, I, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert of, of, that, of that part of the industry at all. Um, but I do think that owning, again, minerals in the ground in safe jurisdictions or places that are uniquely well positioned to develop those mines um, are certainly the best opportunities out there. Um, you know, if you get gold prices going up 15, 20%, uh, the mineral in the ground, given the fact of the risk involved with putting those assets into production uh, and the cost involved with that too, uh, will, uh, will certainly pay off when it comes to the risk relative to the return. And so the returns can be north of, you know, multiples of those companies. You can see a 10 bagger easily. If you see any sort of success in this, not only on the exploration side, but also on 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 the gold cycle being right, and so I think there there are plenty ways of of, of playing this. But I, the physical market is just not the way I'm focused right now. I think other people would be uh, better candidates to to answer that question. Yeah, that's helpful. You know, you're talking a lot about you know, looking at asymmetry in the market and where there are good risk return opportunities. And you've been very vocal about silver. Why is silver potentially an even more attractive opportunity than gold today? Well, simplistically speaking, silver is a high beta version of gold. And if you believe you are in an inflationary era, if you look back in history, silver tends to do very well during those periods. I believe in that. So I, I think silver will... Uh, will be one of the the, the metals that will uh, outperform the overall commodity cycle here, uh, and and its its competitive uh, 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 vehicles that are out there uh, to play this this uh, this move. I think I think gold and silver, um, when you look at the ratio of the two, historically we're seeing um, very elevated levels, meaning gold prices are high relative to where gold where silver is. Um, I think technically speaking, it, it's one of the most attractive charts I've seen uh, in my career. I think it's it, you could see an explosive move up to new highs uh, very quickly. Um, I am, you know, it's it's I know very well the um, I should say I track very closely uh, the supply side of silver, which I know it's it's incredibly difficult to find silver assets out there. It, 
particularly again in exploration side of it. Um, and so that's going to drive the market. I know the geopolitical side of it, meaning Mexico, Peru, some of those more challenging areas of the world are also one of the biggest um, uh, places when it comes to finding silver deposits. And, and so that will make it more and more difficult to supply uh, and feed the world with silver. I think silver fits into not only as a monetary asset, uh, the benefits from this reckless amount of, of fiscal spending and debt and, and monetary uh, disorder that we're seeing, uh, but also it's a it's a green it, it's an asset that fits the, the green revolution, which uh, you know it's it's in my uh, as well be used uh, in in many ways to uh, uh, to feed that that purpose. Um, again, it's and it's probably one of the most undervalued assets relative to the monetary base. Uh, to equity markets, to any other commodity uh, that I've seen. And so I am extremely focused for the next five to 10 years of finding uh, very important silver assets that I think will be uh, worth, you know, multiples of, of where they are today. And I think there are quite a lot of opportunities out there. Uh, I shouldn't say quite a lot. I mean, it's, 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 um, we found some of them, but it's, it's, I think they're, uh, it, it's somewhat restrictive of, of, of unfortunately, just the difficulty of finding silver in general. And so, uh, but it's it's an important market uh, for us. And I think um, I think we're yet to see that that big move uh, in silver prices. And for folks that that complain about the performance, I mean, silver has really gone sideways in, in the last uh, year or so. And it's, so it's not it's not this hasn't been the end of the world. I mean, I've, we've been adding. To our position, every time silver is down three, four, or five percent, we certainly add to our position. We look for more assets in in, in the space, uh, and that, that's what I think. It's the value principle is, is adding to undervalued assets over time, and and accumulating those uh, more and more throughout uh, the course of what we believe it's going to happen in the macro setup. So, um, you know, I, I find this uh, a great opportunity. And um, and I I still think it's one of the most asymmetric opportunities again in 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 sort of the, the metal space in general. What are some of the miners that you would consider to be you know more blue chip type miners that you know have free cash flows today and great balance sheets and well managed, whether it be gold or silver miners? I think there are uh, great opportunities there. I think buying. Uh, any of the royalty companies, you're going to be fine. I mean, the majority of them uh, do a great job selecting their assets. And um, I think all those are going to be okay. Newmont, Barrick, more on the producing side are all interesting opportunities. Uh, but then you have companies like B2 Gold that you know mostly operate in areas like Africa and, and other unsafe jurisdictions, but they're very well known for uh, for for being capable of 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 uh, of managing uh, those operations in those unsafe areas, and so incredible. I mean, they they produce uh, uh, very large amounts of free cash flow relative to their market cap uh, or enterprise value, which is attracts us quite a lot. Um, I think some of the major companies um, will will are just not investing enough, and so they've been very. Uh, had a lot of uh, challenging times when it comes to the shareholder pressure of spending any dollars in 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 finding new exploration assets here, um, and that's mostly because those assets don't generate free cash flow. It won't generate free cash flow anytime soon, and so they've been pressured on spending uh, that capital into those uh, uh, those opportunities. Um, I like the developed phase as well. I think the developed phase. Uh, of the mining industry is uh, is fulfilled with with uh, financially savvy folks that are able of uh, to uh, to really calculate when it comes to the uh, how much free cash flow generation can be driven by those assets uh, and the cost of building those mines uh, and so forth and and how they we come online and and we'll start producing. Uh, but but there are opportunities of miners today trading uh, three times free cash flow, literally less than that sometimes. Um, so we looked at some of those too. But but I think even bigger than that is is again exploration is, is where we are just because of where the the value relative to uh, 
to the you now that is being priced in the markets relative to the the probability of finding something and having something that is truly world class type of, of asset uh, is is just certainly not priced in accordingly. And uh, and when you look at the some of the majors, I mean, look at the price of Newmont. It's it's incredible. Newmont is continuing to do uh, very well, and it's certainly driven by institutional capital. Institutional uh, uh, institutions are certainly starting to allocate capital into this this space, and they start in the easiest parts of the industry, which is Newmont uh, and the large companies. And Newmont's close to new highs. Um, approaching new highs here, and um, and not a lot of people are paying attention to that. So you're starting to see the senior miners doing very well, but not seeing the juniors yet catching up to it. It's a matter of time until the juniors uh, start to lead the way to the upside, and silver starts leading the way to the upside relative to gold too. Again, we haven't seen the riskier parts of the market really play out. But the, the other parts have, have already started. So pay attention to those, those trends because it's a matter of time until that money spill over to other parts of the industry. Yeah, yeah. I know you aren't um, you know, super immersed in the physical market, but one thing I noticed in particular for silver is that the spot price in the physical market you know, was just had a huge spread between the spot market that you could buy in the paper. So I just found that very interesting how there seems to be a lot of demand for the actual physical coins and investors seem to be really bullish on it. You know, transitioning to other potential inflation hedges, we've seen the prices rise substantially for a number of commodities recently, you know, with the global t- tensions and supply chain issues. So I'm curious how you think about commodities and how they fit into constructing a portfolio for you. Yeah, let's let's get into that because I think it's important. Look, the the global equity market is somewhere close to 120 trillion dollars worth. That's that's the whole global equity market today. Just about that amount. Um, natural resources industries are probably worth about 10 trillion dollars, right? So that's 11 times the size of the of the whole in, the natural resource industry. <clears throat> if we take out energy from this, it's only about $3 trillion. Uh, another imbalance that is interesting is looking at Apple's, free, uh, Apple's market cap. It's about, uh, about 40% higher than the entire energy sector in the US. Um, the issue is that Apple produces about, or I should say, the energy companies produce about 50% more in free cash flow than Apple. And so I'm starting to see that those, those inconsistencies in the market are going to are going to close those gaps very soon. Uh, companies in the energy space are making a, a ton of money. Um, I'm a big believer that we're going to see. Now, you know, I, I was saying this way before this this war. Nothing related to the war uh, uh, regarding the the agricultural commodity prices. I thought uh, we we're going to see some sort of food crisis along with energy crisis, meaning that those two parts of the commodity market would rise to significant levels that would start hurting the global economy unsustainably and and also in a way where um, capital cannot really fix this issue because it's it's not just capital a capital problem it's it's again it's a labor problem too uh, where we have a lack of folks that understand this market in order to allocate capital efficiently and so um, and I'm referring to agricultural commodities, especially I thought that the charts when it comes technically speaking, look incredibly attractive. I seen the, uh, the, the capex in the space has been dismal. Uh, same happens with energy companies. Just think about this. I mean, oil prices, um, just call it around a hundred dollars a barrel or higher or lower. Um, when was the last time we've seen that at the same time, energy companies have capex, estimates at multi-decade lows when adjusted to GDP levels. You know, I don't think we've ever seen this. So that gives me a, a lot of conviction that the, the bull market in this space is just getting started. You asked me the question about what's the one metric I look at. Well, CapEx is one of the most important ones. When you start seeing CapEx reaching new highs, watch out. I, I think that's time to you know get out of that trade. But it's, I think it's going to play out in many, many years uh, the political environment may shift and, and help some of those companies to to put more, more money to work in, in terms of capital spending. 
Um, it may not shift, and, and and that will shift my view when it comes to investing in this or not. Um, I think there are many ways of of being protected against inflation. Commodities is one way to do it. Um, and when you look at the equity markets today, at the valuations that we are relative to housing market, for instance. I think there is a setup today as well where the housing market may perform incredibly well relative to, uh, to, to the stock market. So for folks thinking about retirement for the next 10 years or so, at least the, the, the type of strategy that you should be invested in uh, for the next 10 to 15 years, I think the housing market looks much more attractive than, uh, than the stock market. So, um, you know, and, and the other thing on commodities that is important is we haven't even seen the boom in infrastructure developments. We haven't seen the non-residential uh, residential, uh, building happen. And those trends are very low relative to history still. We're seeing the pickup of residential um, um, uh, building, but it's it's not to absurd levels just yet. So, how is that going to drive commodity markets? It's going to be an important driver, in my view, of, of the demand side. Um, and uh, and so I would, you know, I'm, I'm, I still think you're in the market right now that you want to be buying the dip on commodities, and we'll have plenty, you know, dips, uh, you know, in, in in the course of five to ten years. And I think you want to be buying those dips, and I think you want to be selling the rallies in equity markets as a whole. It seems like we can't talk about inflation hedges nowadays without asking about Bitcoin. Do you consider Bitcoin, you know, any sort of an inflation hedge or more of a risk on type trade? Well, it's a more of a risk on type trade. I mean, you no know, copper could be a risk on type of trade too. It has its similar attributes when it comes to the correlation with other risk on assets. Um, I think Bitcoin, you know, serves its purpose uh, when it comes to being an alternative to the monetary system. I think we are seeing the biggest libertarian political movement we've seen in history in the crypto space. Uh, by that, I mean, you know, folks with similar ideologies questioning the credibility of any fiat currency that has no anchor. And also, I think that will force central banks again to be improving the quality of their international reserve. It's something we haven't seen in many, many years um, and decades, I should say. And, uh, you know, maybe Bitcoin will play out, you know, as, as one of those alternatives. But I think central banks are much more open to buying gold than Bitcoin. Um, but it doesn't mean Bitcoin doesn't have its value. I mean, it's certainly um, a place that is is developing in the digital world in general and, and uh, will continue to serve that purpose. But I just don't think that you have the same level of inefficiency. Uh, and efficiency in, in in the crypto market versus some parts of the commodity market just yet. So um, everyone is, 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 is sort of an extension of the technology sector and technology sector is a very crowded sector. There's a lot of smart guys. There's no lack of smart labor in general. I mean, uh, you can find software engineers that are just geniuses. And, and I mean, this whole industry is, is, is fulfilled with young in smart people in general. And so at what point do we see that shifting towards uh, the geology side? I think we will see that. Now I'm thinking about how do I make money on that shift? Because it's a quite, it's a matter of time until it, it's, again, it's all about capital. You, you get a copper mine, start paying the, the same amounts that, that some of the technology companies pay uh, those employees you're going to see that shift very quickly. You know, it, it, the labor is going to follow the, the money here uh, very, very quickly. And so um, the, the needs for investing in basic necessities of the economy will drive uh, the, the interest from folks to learn about geology. And if I could be long geology, I would. <laughs> and I think one of the ways of doing that is being long natural resources um, and industries in general. But um but yeah, that's you know it's kind of a long answer, but I uh, I believe that that Bitcoin we own Bitcoin in the past. I've owned Bitcoin in the past too, and I think it's it's a it's it's a, a true movement, um, and uh, it will continue to be here for for many many uh, decades, and, um, and and you shouldn't ignore it. But at the same time, I'm looking for you know interesting opportunities that I don't need to put a lot of capital, and the risk is 
is um, is not being priced accordingly to the opportunity of those assets to performing well in the future. And I don't know if 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 crypto is is in that camp again. When you have enough smart guys all thinking in the same place, I mean, obviously you you remove most of the inefficiencies in the market. So I think we're kind of there in, in the crypto space and it doesn't mean you won't make money, but are you going to make multiples of your money? I also don't think you're going to do that. So I think we've seen that, you know, we've seen the last few years of that. And and I don't think we're going to see, uh, again, um, you know, those, those, crazy big opportunities relative to what you may see in other industries. I love that. And Tavi, thank you so much for joining me. Such a, you know, informative conversation, just so much knowledge packed into many of your answers. So I really, really appreciate you coming onto the podcast. Before we close out the episode, where can the audience go to connect with you and learn more about your work? Well, thanks for the opportunity, Clay. It was a pleasure to speak with you. And I think uh, you can find my work on Twitter, at Tavi Costa. Um, And I also uh, write uh, letters, I would say say monthly, but a little bit, bit, depends on my time, but I would say uh, every month and a half for two months, I I help to write some large, big letters uh, with a lot of in-depth research on the macro environment. And you can find that at um, uh, crescat.net is our website. Um, and that those are the ways you can find my work. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tavi. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.